happy to be talking to Professor Matthew Fry Jacobson about his recent book, One Grain of Sand, that was published by Bloomsbury Academic Press in 2019. Professor Jacobson, thanks for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to be talking with you. So it was exciting to read your book about Odetta and in particular her album, One Grain of Sand. And I'd love to hear you talk first about a little bit about Odetta's life and career and about the family that she was born into. Okay. Odetta um, was born in Depression era Alabama, um, but left uh, for the West Coast at a fairly young age. Um, she was four or five when her family left. And in that sense, um, she's very much a child of the Great Migration. Um, in that she did get at least a, a, a short experience of the Jim Crow South. Um, and in fact, some of her earliest um, memories of, of overt racism were on actually on the, the train on the way out of Alabama. Um, but they settled in Los Angeles, um, where she grew up very much in a kind of more cosmopolitan, certainly, than, than Alabama. Um, in the sense that her one of her best childhood friends was a Japanese American girl who ended up um, being interned shortly after uh, Odetta's family um, moved to Los Angeles. Um, so it was a more mixed and cosmopolitan kind of setting than than the one she had been born into, but um, largely uh, an African American culture and largely transplanted and recently transplanted from uh, from the South. Her mother um, was what in uh, the day would have been called probably a, a washerwoman or perhaps a cleaning woman, but she worked for a theater troupe. And in fact, that ended up being Odetta's first connection to the theater. It was, it was that community that recognized in Odetta as a fairly young girl, the kind of talent that she had and that, that she might um, be able to hone. And that community actually pitched in to sponsor her classical training. So she, she was classically trained as a singer and ultimately a performer. She, she goes on to um, attend college um, in the theater arts um, and, and really is, is studying to be a classical singer. She, people talked about her as the next Marian Anderson, um, which ultimately is something that she chafed at. She, as she says, I, I didn't want to be the next anything. I wanted to be me. And she found her way um, kind of flukishly into the folk world in um, North Beach in the Bay Area and uh, and decided to, to throw aside everything that she had been trained to do and to pick up folk music that was in the early 50s. Um, she'd been in a... Um, on, in a theater production and, and probably there's no question she had a future in that if she had chosen to stay with it. Um, she was in Finian's Rainbow in 1949. That was the direction she was headed into, but she really chucked it aside in the early 50s. Um, and by 1954, she's cutting her first album, um, which is a, a folk album. And I think that is the thing that drew me to her as, as an object of study and as, I mean, just someone who I admire so much. I mean, the, the beauty of her music and her, the power of her voice and her, her talent is just, um, it's majestic. Um, but I was really interested in that story of, you know, how, how does a young African-American woman in her, you know, around 2021 20, decide that she wants to make this kind of unheard of jump from the classical world that she's been, that she's really been trained for and reared for uh, into the uncertain world of folk music. And um, I just think it was a, it's a fascinating story from just the, the kind of performance and arts angle, but the politics of it are also fascinating. I mean, she, from the beginning really talked about the folk repertoire as um, as a resource for African Americans. So her first album is 1954. Um, she's already fairly famous nationally by 1957, 1958. Um, this is a period where there really was no such thing as African American studies in the curriculum at any level. And she recognized the repertoire 
um, by which I mean, you know, the field hollers, the prison songs, the blues, um, as a resource for African Americans to recover their own history and to know something about not only where they had been, but also to know something of their resilience and their, their inner strength and power. And that's how she talked about the repertoire. And she always talked about herself as both an archivist and an educator in that sense. Um, other people talked about her that way too, ultimately. Um, but that was another piece of it that was just really fascinating to me and that, that really underscored what an important figure um, she was in, in her moment. So why don't you take us to One Grain of Sand? Tell us a little bit about the album and why you decided to write about One Grain of Sand. So this was this book was written um, really on assignment for a series that's called 33 and a Third. And the assignment is to pick an album and write about it. And I listened, I wanted to write about her. Um, I should say, I mean, this project spun out of another project. This, there was going to be an Odetta chapter in a much broader book about the cultural history of the civil rights era. Um, so she had been on my mind for some time. Um, when the opportunity to write for this series came up, uh, I listened to all of her albums and really thought about where I wanted to enter this conversation. Um, musically, there might have been different choices to make. I think most people might have chosen her 1957 album as the one that's maybe the, that was kind of her signature. But One Grain of Sand is, by anybody's measure, one of her best albums and one of her most important. And for me, as a historian, the most important thing about it was that it was uh, it was released in 1963, um, same year that she appears on the stage uh, alongside all of those other luminous figures in both the arts and politics uh, at the, the March on Washington. Um, but it's also, I mean, and this was the occasion of the march. It was the 100-year um, anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And so as a historian kind of entering this work, thinking about it as a historian's meditation on an artistic production, um, that was really compelling because her repertoire and her approach to the repertoire uh, and the, the moment of the album's release gave me permission to reflect on that hundred years of African-American history between between the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and the March on Washington. And, and in a sense, that's, that's how I would describe the book. It's a, it's a historian's meditation on that hundred years through the lens of Odetta's own um, artistic and archival practices. And most immediately in advance of the release of the album on January 1st, 1963, what was Odetta doing? What was happening in the United States that perhaps shaped the production of One Grain of Sand? in advance of its release on January 1st, 1963? Well, she, um, you know, she had been traveling through the, the folk world um, almost for 10 years at that point, um, or just about 10 years at that point, um, and had been a fairly well-known national figure in those circles for the last five of those years. Um, this is a moment when to be a folk singer really was to be something. There was a whole circuit of, of really important folk venues um, from the West Coast through uh, cities like Denver and Chicago uh, to um, the East Coast, especially New York, but also Philadelphia and Boston. And she was, she was really one of the mainstays on that circuit in the, in the late 50s. Um, it was in those years that she was um, not only honing her craft as a folk singer, but expanding her repertoire. She spent uh, she spent a good deal of time actually studying um, the you know the old um, Smithsonian Lomax recordings um, in the the libraries of the University of California um, when she was still living there. Um, she spent a lot of time really as a student of the music um, and. And recognizing the political import of the movement of the of the music, she um, she never fancied herself uh, a terribly important political figure, even if she totally felt that 
there was political import to what she was trying to do as a musician. So when she showed up um, at the March on Washington, for example, it was at the invitation of other people. There were other people who said, you got to be there. We have to have you there. We need Odetta's voice in, as part of this as part of this. And she always answered that call. So, you know, that kind of thing had probably started happening a few years earlier. Um, so she was, she was already well known on the political circuits at that point, but, um, but much more well known just as, as, as a folk singer who had a really deep and rich kind of repertoire that, that reflected something important about the African American experience. Well, it's a beautifully structured book and you talk about the ways in which, um, One Grade of Sand um, embodies um, Odetta's approach to the folk repertoire, says something about how she worked with the archive of Black history and was also for her a vehicle of for radical expression, in your words. Can you say a little bit more about how you uh, organized the book uh, into sections and how you decided which songs on One Grade of Sand to look closely at? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I, I will say there are two pieces of it that were the germs or the kernels of the whole idea. Um, one was something I understood very well, and the other was something I felt I needed to understand but didn't quite. The thing I understood very well was the significance of that folk coffee house circuit that I just described to you. Um, as a as a political and social space, I just thought that this is. Um, these venues represented a really important crossroads in the culture where all kinds of people were coming together uh, in an era when the left really needed that. I mean, this is, I think one of the things that we often forget about the, the modern civil rights era is that, that the civil rights public that had existed before the war um, was just decimated by McCarthyism and by the kind of post, post-war, um, Cold War politics of anti-communism. Um, and so if, if there was going to be um, a revival of a, a real robust kind of civil rights politics, as we know there was, um, the first thing that was going to have to happen was a new um, civil rights public was going to have to be kind of found and forged and encouraged and nourished. And, um, you know, this is, this is in some ways, it's a story that's been told as the transition from the old left to the new left. It's a story that's been told in terms of the transition from the black church to secular spaces like college campuses. Um, all of that is, is important. But I think that these coffee houses in the late 50s and early 60s were a place where um, old left folk singers like Pete Seeger and the Weavers and new left figures like Joan Baez and Bob Dylan um, old um, kind of blues um, figures in their publics like Huddy Ledbetter and the, the kind of Alan Lomax crowd, um, new folk singers like Odetta herself, um, beat poets. Um, it was just a really protean space where all kinds of people came together. And you could see at some of these clubs like the Gate of Horn in, in Chicago or the Hungry Eye in San Francisco, you might, you might hear Odetta singing field hollers one night and then and then hear a kind of left comedian like Mort Saul the next night and then hear um a, a blacklisted folk singer like Will Gear the night after that you know you just didn't know kind of what you were going to see from night to night or week to week and I think that the publics that cross through those spaces are um are really important to the story of of the early um the early civil rights um the, the post-war um, iteration of the civil rights freedom struggle. Um, so that was a piece that I knew I wanted to tell. Um, and the song that I chose to do that with was Cool Water, which was a kind of folk standard uh, initially sung as a cowboy song, made most famous probably by Roy Rogers, although he wasn't the first to do it. Um, but Odetta's version is, is just what she does musically with it is completely different. It was to serve a very different purpose. She sung it in a metaphorical register. It's a story about, it's quite literally about a cowboy and his horse dying of thirst in the desert. And she turns it into this kind of metaphorical, um, really powerful um, kind of um, allegory about, uh, about 
the cool water of freedom and being denied that. Um, so I used, you know, I, I used the occasion of that song and what she does generically and artistically with that song to think about the, the political work that was being done in those coffee house spaces by the cultural work that singers like her were doing. Um, so that was, that was kind of in place before I started writing. That was something I knew I wanted to do. The, the piece that I knew I needed to deal with, but I didn't know what to do with it was the, um, the song uh, Midnight Special, which is probably the most famous song on the album. It's a song that, that um, it's been done so many times by so many different people. Um, it's in some ways the most familiar of all the songs that's on that, that's on that album. I was always a little bit confused by it. It's, this, it's a song, um, the, the Midnight Special is a train. And uh, the refrain is shine your light on me. And I never could figure out it's it's this the lyrics are clearly it's about a prison house. So, you know, there's that dimension. It's a little bit hard to follow. And I was never sure whether shine your light on me meant that the train was going to redeem the narrator of the song and, and, and take him or her away or whether it was actually a suicide song. And in researching the song, which dates back to the late 19th century in various versions, um, what I discovered is that you can find versions that emphasize one or the other of those things. Odetta herself actually really played with that. So her versions changed over the time. Um, so that in, in the 1957 version that she cut, it's very clearly the song of redemption. Whereas in the 1963 version that's on One Grain of Stand, she's actually She's emphasized different things. She's reordered the verses in such a way that it's clearly a song about death on the, on the tracks. Um, so that was just, that was a puzzle that I was trying to figure out, figuring out how to understand the song, but also placing it in the long kind of long-lived genre of the prison song, which is so important in the African-American tradition. And so, again, that was just, it was um, a a, a piece of a pretty long stretch of African-American history that could be meditated upon and told through the history of the song itself and its various um, variations over the years and, and including Odetta's own variations on the theme. So those were the two pieces I started with. Um, and then the two pieces I added, one is, um, one is on um, the, spirit, the spiritual kind of strain of the music um, and the other is on, uh, there are two Southern songs. One is about the bow weevil and, uh, the other is, uh, about, um, the old cotton plantation. Um, so taking kind of spiritual geographies and social geographies, um, and, and again, talking about those themes through songs on the album that became the strategy for the album was to try to think really deeply about history, but to do it through, um, the, the kinds of questions and answers that were at hand in the music itself, you know, which is for me, I mean, that's one of the things that was such a delight about working on this project. Um, there was a lot of freedom in terms of what I could do in the, um, in this assignment. Um, but that intersection between political and social history on the one hand and, um, artistry and cultural production and genre on the other. I mean, that's kind of where I live as a cultural historian. So it, it just felt like a really rich opportunity. And, and her archive is, um, is really quite extraordinary for that kind of reflection. Let me ask you a particular question about her relationship to religion, um, which, as you said, is a, a primary focus of one of your four sections. So you quote Odetta registering some distrust of institutional religion, or at least the leaders of institutional uh, churches um, in the post-war period. Um, she would later recall that, quote, I didn't believe anything the ministers said. When the music started, I trusted that. Could you talk a little bit more about? Yeah, that was, I mean, you know, this was not an easy piece of writing for me for several reasons. One, one, um, I'm not Christian. Um, and, and I'm not an African-American Christian, so there's, um, some sensitivity about how are you going to approach materials like this? Um, so there's that 
But there's also, I think, the historian's tendency, and, and I think this runs pretty deep in the, the civil right in civil rights history as a genre, to take um, to literally some of the liberationist strains of Christian theology and to, to kind of map them onto the politics of the time. And you know, and clearly um, that was important. It's important that the black church was such an important, it was such a crucial site for the, the struggle um, in the 1940s and 50s. It's, and that that's, you know, where a figure like um, Martin Luther King emerges from. It's crucial that King himself is citing chapter and verse all the time in his political oratory. So these things are important, but I think they're, they're too easily oversimplified. Um, this particular chapter was something that I struggled with because I think I oversimplified it myself. I really just tried to read uh, African-American Christianity as liberation theology and to kind of too, too facilely read the, um, the political symbolism of the ways that a figure like Odetta was using um, the Gospels. And... I was fortunate to be corrected in that by our colleague Katie Lofton in religious studies, who who read who read an early draft of the chapter and said, "No, no, no, no. You have to um, you have to understand that that Christianity is a problem too. It's not just the, it's not just the answer to the problem. It's also part of the problem." And she gave me some reading assignments, including a fantastic book by our uh, another of our colleagues, Willie Jennings, on racism and and the Christian tradition. Uh, along with many other things. And it was actually through the rethinking that that um, Katie Lofton had urged that I I actually found um, some of those quotes, including the one that you just mentioned from Odetta herself talking about religion in a much more um, problematized way, in an, a richer way. And um, so one of the things I tried to do in that chapter is not not just lose the liberationist strand of um, of Christian theology and and Christian symbology, um, but also to to try to capture some of the complexities and even the paradoxes that are embedded in it in the ways that that um, you know if if it is true that that Christianity um, was one of the symbol systems for imagining. Uh, liberation on the part of the slaves. It was also one of the symbol systems that allowed for slavery in the first place, you know. And so, to try to really think about that paradox and to think about how that carries through over the the hundred years leading up to 1963, when Odetta is singing and and how she's kind of positioning herself in relation to those those um, paradoxes and those kind of contending streams. So the book, in part, positions uh, Odetta. Uh, in dialogue with, contention with, in some ways, um, Christian theology, Christian churches, churchgoers, um, all developing at a time in which the civil rights movement is changing. You also think about Odetta, as you mentioned already, um, as a figure shaped by the Great Migration. And I'd love to hear you talk more about that. Um, you say, you know, uh, that at least a few of her songs, quote, belong to the vast cross-genre canon of post-migration Black narratives alongside Jacob Lawrence's migration series, Richard Wright's 12 Million Black Voices, Langston Hughes's One Way Ticket, or Bessie Smith's Gulf Coast Views. So can you say more about how her work uh, produced outside of the South, for the most part, engaged historical and contemporary conditions in that region and understandings of the South? So the, the two songs that I really focus on in this context um, are um, Cotton Fields, and Bo Weevil, both of which are about the South. But the, the argument I try to make is that they're very much, um, they're, they're performed outside of the South and they're performed for the most part for people who have removed themselves from the South, but that that dimension is really important. So they're, they're a kind of backward reflection on um, not just a, a kind of, um, geographical space, but a, a kind of historical space as well. So there's a, a temporal and spatial geography to those songs that I think is, is really important. And um, so there, it's, not, um, it's not as literally the kind of, of migration narrative um, that so many other um, writers and including singers um, 
made famous. Um, but I think it's it's in a similar genre in the sense that um, these are songs that could not have been performed this way, nor been thought of as important in this way, if they weren't on the other side of the experience of migration, and if they weren't in some ways a reflection back onto a space that had been successfully escaped. I mean, that's, that I guess is the the thing that that really defines them, and it's I think it's very subtle. One of the things I argue is that that if you listen really closely, and especially in, um, in cotton fields, I think it's it's most uh, subtle, and, and maybe you just it takes some study to really hear it. But there's a kind of agitation in her version of that song that um, that really speaks about um, the danger and the hazards uh, and the violence of the South. Um, and what it what it might mean to to escape it, or what what it might mean in, in the literal context of the lyrics to be entrapped within it. So you urge us to think about Odetta alongside many other cultural figures in the mid and late twentieth century. And I just want to throw out some names that appear uh, in your book, One Grain of Sand, and just ask you to to say something about one or more of them about their relationship to Odetta and her work. I'm thinking of people like Paul Robeson, Josh White, Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, Nina Simone, Bernice Johnson Reagan, and others. The name that jumps out at me is is Robeson because I think that his approach to art was very much the approach that Odetta herself adopted, and whether whether she got it directly from him or indirectly through many of the mutual acquaintances that they had. I'm not, I'm not sure, but, um, but his, his idea that, um, that artistic expression could be political expression was absolutely important um, to how she thought about her task as a singer. Um, and also, I mean, the way that I think, um, as a stylist, if that's the right word, you know, Robeson was famous for performing in this kind of operatic mode that disrupted the expectations, um, especially of white audiences. But um, it just it kind of busted some of the genres of African-American performance at the time in a way that I think was really important and really powerful. And I think that that is something that Odetta took as well because as careful as an archivist as she was um, in studying these old african-american standards um, in the smithsonian collections and the like she was never simply trying to reproduce what she was hearing she actually was making the songs her own in a really important way and uh, the way i ended up putting it is that she she in, inhabits the moral center of a song more than just reproducing the um, the textures of the, the archive as she found it. And I, I think that that's a similar way, although his style was completely different. I think that Robeson did something very similar. When, you know, when he sang a song with that just booming operatic voice, um, he he was doing something that, that the archive was not giving him, but he was bringing his own special kind of power to it. And I think that that's, that's something that, that um, she had in common with him. So as an interpreter of the songs that you write about, some of which, many of which were already in the folk repertoire, you describe how Odetta also um, queered the gendered conventions um, of music as it was inherited by her, her. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which she queered those conventions? Yeah, I think that that's, it's an important part of her work. I mean, some of the things that she did well, by choosing the repertoire itself, I mean, most of the songs that she performed came out of a very male um, kind of tradition. Um, and some of the things that she did with her voice um, played with a kind of, of gender neutrality or ambiguity that I think was really important um, to, the, to, the, to the power of the song. And it was something that a lot of critics at the time commented on without knowing exactly how to understand it. A lot of white listeners didn't like it, frankly. Um, they wanted her to sound more like a lady or appear more like a lady. But I think that her 
conscious decision not to be that performer um, was part of how she saw the politics of, of what she was doing. I mean, it really, it was about kind of disrupting, um, disrupting the status quo, disrupting expectation, pushing people to think in new ways. And I think that for her, um, you know, gender was as important a part um, of that, of that project as, as race was. Now, I wanted to invite you to talk a little bit more about Odetta as a performer. Um, you've written, of course, extensively about this album as a piece, as an archive in and of itself. Um, but you also write in the book about Odetta on stage, um, what she did for audiences, how audiences understood her in the various settings in which she performed uh, before and after 1963. So I wonder if you could take us through some sense of how, what audiences would have seen, what they would have appreciated, what they would have heard, um, had they been in one of Odetta's performances around the time in which One Grain of Sand appeared? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that she, um, it's important to remember how young she was. Um, you know, she was still um, just in her late 20s. And so she was still developing as an artist and, um, or maybe early 30s by then. But um, she was still developing as an artist and she was changing. And, and now with the advantage of retrospect, you can really see that. She, um, one of the most striking things about her, and this was part of her power, and it was something that she never stopped using, was that classical training. I mean, she, she held the stage um, with the kind of majesty of the great operatic singers. She just did. She just... Um, she held the stage in a way that um, she just looked immovable. She looked as immovable as she sounded. And that was part of, it was part of the power of her performance. In those years, she had a kind of seriousness that um, I think was more characteristic of her performances in those years than later on. She, she, her friends would say was one of the funniest people you would ever meet in your life. And there's plenty of evidence for that. And you can hear that in some of the later live recordings, but, but for the most part in the later ones, you don't hear that so much in the late fifties or early sixties. Um, I think that became more a part of her kind of stage patter um, later on, but she, she, she had a fearsome sense of humor um, and she over time learned how to deploy that. But I think that that was less a part of her act um, in the years that we're talking about. I think that the more striking thing um, through probably the late 60s was just the, the power of her presence and her seriousness of purpose. So Matt, you've written about Odetta. You've spoken to many people about Odetta. You've taught about Odetta. I know she's made her way into the courses um, that you've given over the years. And my sense is um, from hearing you talk that you think of her as a person who was profoundly influential uh, in the late 20th century, but also a, perhaps a person who's not widely recognized by many people today. So can you talk a little bit more about how you see the influence of Odetta um, on, say, other musicians? You mentioned this in the book, Joe, people like Joan Baez, Rhiannon Giddens, her influence on politically engaged Americans, people like Rosa Parks, artists like Spike Lee. Uh, perhaps the ways we understand African American history today. Love to hear you talk a little bit more about her perhaps unrecognized influence. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's one of the puzzles, really, that I never quite resolved is why is it that our students really don't know her? I mean, she's she's almost unknown among younger Americans right now, although I think that that may be changing. My book, it turns out, is the first of a flurry that are going to be coming out soon about her. So maybe maybe that will change. Um, but it's, it is really fascinating that um, after about the 70s or maybe the 80s, when she was still, she was on the college circuit, like she would, she would travel around, she would play at college campuses, and she was still well known among college students, um, certainly when I was in college in the 70s and probably beyond that. Um, but then really kind of drops out um, as someone who is um, kind of famous uh, to um, a younger generation, um, which is just kind of odd because she was truly one of the most famous performers of her generation at the time. I mean, at the time that she's, um, you know, standing next to Martin Luther King um, in 1963, like, you know, everybody knew who she was and everybody knew why she was there. 
Um, so it's, it's kind of startling that that ceased to be the case at some point. Um, on the other hand, she never stopped being a musician's musician. And I think she still is very much that. So, you, you know, you mentioned her name to someone like Brianna Giddens and, um, there's an immediate, um, enthusiasm and excitement, um, to talk about, um, you know, who she was and her influence and what she did. And, 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 you know, and I've had this, I've had, I've been privileged to, um, to have this conversation with, with several, um, current singers like, like Giddens, um, or Valerie June. Um, and you know, for them, Odetta never went away. I mean, she never stopped being important and it, it's just, it's, uh, it's one of the important and, and um, puzzling, perhaps, things about about the arc of her career and her fame. Um, that you know, Bob Dylan famously said that he he picked up a flat top Gibson guitar because of Odetta. Like that was that was the power of her influence at the time, um, and um, somehow um, that just faded for listeners um and i guess you know folk as a genre is not nearly as popular now as it was you know a generation ago but still you know people our students know who woody guthrie was right but i i rare is the student who knows um who odetta was until i tell them well i would just say the book you know one grain of sand goes a long way towards um explaining odetta i think for audiences today and contextualizing her and using her to help rethink the ways in which African American history from roughly 1863 to roughly 1963, with um, uh, bleeding on both sides, um, could be was formulated by her and can be reinterpreted uh, with her in mind by by historians, artists, and others today. And I guess I just want to ask you, by way of closing, closing, if if you have any other thoughts about the ways in which you hope that the book that you've written will work in the world? You know, what are some of the things that you would love readers, whether they're students or fellow academics or others, um, to appreciate about Odetta or to, to be thinking as they walk away from this book about other projects that they might take up or other ways of understanding the world? Mm. I really appreciate the question. Um, even if I've, I've learned over the years to try to be very modest in my ambitions for a book. <laughs> because when you send it out into the world, you just never know what people are going to do with it or how it will be taken up. I guess my fondest hopes would be twofold. One would be that it would um, it would urge people to, to pick up her records again and listen to them and really think about um, the brilliance of her artistry and and the, the the power of the political work that she did through her singing i mean if if um in some small way the book contributed to a, a renewed interest in odetta herself that would be probably the most a person could hope for um you know writing a book um the other thing i would say though is that there is something about method that's embedded in the book that i hope our students would pick up as well that 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 intersection that i mentioned before that that zone where um social and political history meet culture and the culture industries and cultural production and artistry and genre um, is a really, really rich zone. And I would hope that the book might model something about um, cultural analysis and the ways in which um, something as, as seemingly self-evident as a song can actually open up all kinds of doors for historical inquiry. Um, so that's, that's maybe the, the, the wider ambition of the book. Um, but if the, you know, if the book achieves anything at all, I'll be happy. I think it achieves a lot. Uh, Matthew Fry Jacobson, thank you for talking to us about your, your most recent book, One Grain of Sand. Thank you so much for the invitation. This has really been a delight.